I want to use the really 10 minutes just to tell you a little bit about the uh, science of consciousness, which is what I'm doing in the past five years. And basically, I'm going to tell you how consciousness, or whatever you want to call it, the mind, the soul, uh, I, is being studied by scientists in the brain. So there is an assumption that needs to be taken by everyone in the audience if they want to take this leap towards studying consciousness scientifically, and that is that there is something physical to consciousness. That is, if you believe that there is something external to the body that's floating, hovering above you, uh, that's affecting your life, then there's not much that science can do with it. It can't be measured, it can't be tested, it can't be... There's nothing much that you can do with it. But science has to assume that things like that, especially abstract things like consciousness, have some physical uh, entity that is reflected in the brain, that's the assumption. And I've been trying in a lab of uh, 12 people to do several studies that are trying to tap into the mechanisms that make this thing we call consciousness tick. The way we do <coughs> our studies is uh, using uh, patients, uh, very unique patients who suffer from all kinds of diseases, especially epilepsy. This is, this is a, a, of the brain. And they come to the uh, surgery to the, to the hospital to be treated for this particular disease. Uh, let's say it's epilepsy because that's the majority of our patients. They come and they're going into a several, uh, several phases of, of treatment, second of which is one where their brains are opened and electrodes are placed inside their brains uh, while they're awake and staying in a hospital bed for uh, between 7 to 12 days. And their the medications are tempered and we wait for them to have as many seizures as possible. So there's a person sitting in bed, his brain is open, and there are electrodes in various locations deep inside his brain. It's an area called the medial temporal lobe, which is simply put the center of the brain really deep inside. You have to really squeeze deep the electrode to penetrate this part of the brain and go deeper into the area that we think consciousness is residing in. And then we have those patients sit there and wait. They can, they, their, their brains are wired to a machine, they sit there, they watch TV, they talk to their families, and we just wait, tempering their medication slowly, hoping that they're going to have seizures. And when they do have those seizures, we can actually use the electrode to monitor the, the way the seizure spreads in their brain and see where it starts, to which electrode it goes, and kind of how the spread of the seizure goes through the brain. And having done that a few times, having seen them going through few seizures within the course of a week, we can actually locate and pinpoint the exact position of the, the focus of the seizures, so where, this, where the epileptic seizures begin, the particular point. And then when we have located this, part, this particular place, uh, we try to see if it's a, an important part of the brain, that is, if it's a part of the brain that, if removed, would make the person lose some abilities or not. Hopefully it's not. There are many parts of the brain that are redundant, like memory areas that just keep the same backups of the memories, so we can take them out and not affect the person in any way, as far as we can tell. And then if everything goes well, that is, if we located the correct area in the brain where seizures begin, if there's a particular single small area in the brain, and this particular area is one that you can lose and not lose anything of your personality, we go to phase three where this patient comes again at the end of the 10 days and with a little device we remove this particular part of the brain, take it out and the patient goes away seizure free for the rest of his life. It's a pretty new treatment, there have been by now a couple of hundreds of like 400 and something patients who have taken this uh, particular treatment and to the, best, to the best of our knowledge, it's pretty new, so it's, no, there's not enough evidence to tell if there's any long-term effects, but to the best of our knowledge, they're all seizure-free for now on, that mean, which means they can drive a car, they can function, so the treatment by itself is working. That said, there's my part in this procedure, which is interacting with the patients during the time that they're in the hospital. So we have a patient who is sitting there with his brain open, and there are electrodes in his, in his brain, and now he's just waiting. He's sitting there, not doing much, just waiting to have seizures. So as far as he's concerned, nothing, nothing important happens. He just waits there. And now I, I can come to him and start asking him questions. And asking questions about whatever I care about. At the same time, look with those electrodes inside his brain and see what parts of the brain respond. So I can simply put, ask him, what color do you see in this piece of paper? He says blue, and I see one particular electrode that's responding, and I can tell that's the part of the brain that's in charge of the color of blue. 
and I can show him another thing and see that this other thing makes a, show a picture of his, himself and see a, a, a different part of the brain responding. And I can say that's the part of the brain that's responding or remembering or in charge of the self part of the brain. And we can do that with many areas of the brain, identifying all various kinds of uh, all kinds of things that the brain does, which is to this date the most uh, advanced technology that exists in brain science towards understanding the brain with humans. You can do many things with animals, but with humans there's only one set of studies that actually happens in that level where you can actually put an electrode deep inside the brain, see one single cell in the brain and interact with it. This is the method that we're using. My particular study is basically trying to trace the consciousness aspect of the brain and simply put, we're doing it in the following way. We find, we find a particular part of the brain, a particular cell, single cell, that's responsive for something. That is, for instance, we can find a cell that's responsive for a picture of Bill Clinton. We do find those often, so that's not a, typical, not, that's not a, a unique example. We, we, we have the patients usually interact with one of us for a while before we start the studies. We ask them what they care about, what, their, uh, what, what music they like, what sports they are, uh, they're interested in many things, and we form a set of uh, images that correspond to what they care about, and we start showing those to them again and again, and we hope to see one of those electrodes lighting whenever we show one picture, and if we find that picture, we say, okay, we found the cell in the brain that's responsive for that thing. It could be a picture of yourself, a picture of a musical instrument, a band that you like, some uh, actor that you care about, many things. We typically find various of those. Let's say we found one patient that has a one cell that responds to the concept of Bill Clinton. And by concept I mean the patient can see a picture of Bill Clinton and the cell would fire. The patient can imagine, close his eyes and imagine Bill Clinton and the cell would fire. The patient can hear Bill Clinton speaks like a recording of Bill Clinton, the cell would fire. Every time the patient is aware of the concept of Bill Clinton, in whatever invariant way you can think of, this cell responds. That's the cell in the brain that's responsive for Bill Clinton. I later on would take back some of what I say now because there are more, there's more than one such cell in the brain and there are probably many, many copies of that, but for now, let's assume that there's only one of those. One cell in the brain that's responsive for Bill Clinton and we have just found it. Now, the experiments I do with those patients have to do with the following. I would show the patient a movie, for instance, and the movie would have one thing that the patient would have to focus on. That is, I would now tell him, try to count how many times um, the, the number nine appears on the screen. And he would sit there and see a bunch of things on the screen, including number nine appearing on the screen again and again, and he would have to count how many times within the course of five minutes the number nine appears on the screen. And he would do that for five minutes, count, and his answer would be 65 times. This would be correct, maybe, or maybe not, but what we care about is not even the number nine, we care about something else. While he's counting the appearance of number nine, we're going to flash a picture of Bill Clinton on the screen numerous times. He is not focusing on that. He is counting number nines. But on the screen there are many, many things lying around, including Bill Clinton. So his <laughs> brain sees Bill Clinton. He himself is not aware of that. And what we try to do is trace the pathway in his brain that leads to his becoming aware of Bill Clinton or not. So his brain is exposed to a picture of Bill Clinton. He himself doesn't tell me, hey, I've seen Bill Clinton just now. The question is, what is the brain doing? That is, can we look at this particular cell and see if this cell is activated, saying something like, hey, I've seen Bill Clinton just now, or not? And we actually find cells that do either some cells that respond to Bill Clinton when he's there, some that do not, and we start slowly very, very, uh, very slow because we just don't control where to put the electrodes. It's based on the clinical needs. But with each patient, we try to walk along this pathway from the eye all the way to the place in the brain where you clearly are no longer in control of what's happening to you and try to see at what point in the brain is this mechanism deciding. Now, this information that's flowing, the eye definitely seen Bill Clinton. Me, I don't know that Bill Clinton is there. Who is the guy in between that decides, hey, become aware of that, throw it up there to this place. And we actually found a brain mechanism, at least one, we now we're battling between one to four, that we claim uh, what you would call is this conscious percept mechanism. The one person that up to it, Bill Clinton is, is traveling, and there, there's a decision-making process that decides to either throw Bill Clinton up or not. So this was, this is how we study consciousness uh, in the past four years. I'm gonna 
tease you a little bit with some things we can do with that. So afterwards in the in the in kind of in the questionnaire session you can ask me, ask me more about that. But we use this information to do many things that are not just purely scientific to understand consciousness, we actually try to apply things to consciousness. They want to um, the applications that are useful to human beings. For instance, I can tell you uh, two stories um, and show you how we actually help that. And that's kind of a, uh, how I'm going to tie my talk to evolution, simply. So it's three more minutes that I need from your time. I'm going to tell you two stories about two uh, people that you, you might not know of, but are pretty important for scientific advance. And one of them is called uh, Oscar Pistorius. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him. He's a South an uh, African runner, sprint runner, who is uh, regarded as one of the fastest uh, people on earth. He's been winning many uh, running competitions since he was actually disqualified from uh, competing in the 2008 Olympics in China because the one thing that is different between him and any other runner is that he has no legs. He's regarded the fastest man on no legs. And he was born with a unique disease that basically made his legs not function and at the age of three months his parents had to make this hard decision of uh, amputating both his legs and he has been raised with no legs for a while and uh, a few years ago uh, a company in California called Sabre uh, invented a unique set of uh, legs, basically uh, prosthetic legs that they attached to his uh, half limbs that still exist and he is, uh, they look like kind of like springs and he can run very fast with them. In fact, if you see a video on YouTube of him running in a competition, you'll see him passing all the other runners by far. Only two weeks ago, there was the uh, Berlin competition where there was a guy who broke all the, uh, a Jamaican runner who broke all the records. And he's, according to some of the records that are claimed by South Africa, uh, with him, he's probably breaking th those records as well. So he's by far a fast runner, much faster than us. Is this, does it, what does it mean? He has legs that were built by human beings. They're not part of evolution. But that is, the human biology didn't lead to those prosthetic legs if you not count the, the fact that humans who evolved actually built those legs. And he's much better than us in this competition that supposedly reflects the strengths of uh, human activity. That's one person, Oscar Pistorius. I'm going to go back to him in a second and show you how it relates to what we do. The second person I want to talk to you about is a uh, famous model called Amy Mullin. I'm not sure you know her name, but you've probably seen her pictures in many, many magazines in the US. And she, again, is a very pretty girl. Uh, I think she's 31 now, if I'm not mistaken, and she's modeling in many ads that you've seen. And she, too, has no legs. Hers were uh, amputated because of other disease when she was a little uh, older. And again, she was, she, they, they gave her prosthetic legs. What's unique about her, for the sake of our story, is that she chose to uh, actually ask this company to create 12 pairs of legs. So she has 12 pairs of legs with, with which she walks perfectly as a model. You would not notice if you've seen her on a runway uh, as a model that she has something uh, not uh, something artificial about her. But she has all kinds of legs from all kinds of designs. Some of them are pretty unique by themselves. So the legs are actually part of the dress. So sometimes the legs are made of wood and they have all kinds of flowers coming out of them. And they're pretty unique. So she uses this particular this order, if you want, or this advantage that usually would have seen as something bad to actually create something that's better for her. And I think the, the story that I like the most of hers is that at one point she went back to her school for a school reunion and she decided to wear the longest legs of her. So she was six feet two for that particular event. And she came and she saw one of her friends from school and she said, hey, Amy, how come you're so tall? She said, well, I decided to wear my uh, six foot two legs today. And this girl looked at her and said, that's so unfair. And that's the first time that you can see that, that in a way, there's a, an advancement of, uh, or advantage towards the fact that someone who lost his leg can actually use this advantage that science gives us to actually look prettier or better than us. Now, I'm working now on coming up with a new project that I want to tell you about that I think is very interesting uh, for this audience with the related to brain and the... Uh, and evolution, and we call it, uh, it I'm not the first to, to throw this name sadly, but I'm going to coin this on thing I'm part of, we call it Human 2.0. And the idea behind Human 2.0 is that there are many things that humans so far uh, have in their bodies that are not bad advantages. That is, we can think of something that's much better for us that biology just didn't give us. And if we wait two, two million years, we might get those wings that we all look forward to and fly better than, than any other. But right now we have a very short life and we better get those things faster than us. So there's a project uh, of a bunch of scientists now that are trying to use the, the things that science gives us to build artificial 
organs for humans that are going to give them advantages that so far uh, biology didn't give us. Uh, for instance, uh, since we know how the brain mechanisms of sen sensation work, there's no reason not to connect to them. And if I'm sitting now in uh, Nevada and I want to know the temperature in New York, the way I do it so far, I'm going to I don't know, uh, weather.com, I look at the weather, it says that it's 20 Fahrenheit, I can somehow remember in my mind what 20 Fahrenheit means, but I can't really feel it. Why not connect a uh, cooling mechanism to the body that I'm going to press something and I'm going to actually feel what it is to be in New York right now, understand what to wear, put the clothes, and then I could go back to my original temperature and go to New York where I would feel it. Why not actually change our temperature? If I want to go one step further, why not use the fact that uh, I'm investing in stocks and I know exactly where, what part of the brain is the pain mechanism. Why not actually connect my stock my, uh, portfolio to the pain level and whenever the stock is full, I'm going to actually feel pain and I know exactly how, how to understand what uh, happens to my stock exchange because I'm going to feel like this itch on my hands and I'm going to know that something bad is happening. Why not connect my body to the world outside me? So if so there's a little crack in the wall, I immediately feel the scratch and I say, oh, something is bad, something bad is happening to the world, I better notice. What I'm trying to tell you is that we're very, very religious in the way we treat our bodies. We think that uh, everything that we're born with is something that's there, given to us by God, and it's something that we can't change, we better not use it. As my dad told me, he has this little teeth that's a little bit uh, crooked. And he told me, I went to the doctor, and the doctor told me, why don't I just remove this teeth and put like, a plastic teeth instead? And he said, no way, that's something I, I was given. And in a way, what I'm suggesting is that we could start thinking of Human 2.0 as a project where we would start thinking of whatever we think is better for us and maybe replace our bodies with something better. The way we did it, to finalize my talk, is that we had those patients that I told you earlier actually locate part of the brain that they can clearly understand what it does. For instance, we took this particular patient who could clearly activate one cell in the brain whenever he thought of Bill Clinton. And we told him, now, whenever you think of Bill Clinton, you're going to see a spaceship on the screen. You know the game Space Invaders, where there's like a little spaceship? and it, uh, there's like a villain spaceship above and it needs to fire and kill them so he's told, you sit there every time you think of Bill Clinton, it's going to go left if you think of uh, Maria Kelly, it's going to go right if you think of me, it's going to fire now you sit in front of the screen and start playing the game and he sits there and he just thinks of Bill Clinton, it goes right it left, he thinks of Maria Kelly, it goes right and he starts playing a game and he's getting better and better after very little time in controlling this spaceship and he for, the, for whatever we care about, he's just playing a video game. But he does that without his brain. So we can think of this particular patient who has no limbs, for instance, and connect those Bill Clinton or those Mariah Carey cells to, a, to an, uh, a prosthetic limb and have him control the limb as if it's his own with his brain. It's just rewire the brain completely with our ability to understand the brain and our ability to build robotic arms. And that's the next level of helping people that are coming back from war, losing their legs, losing their arms. That's the next level of actually helping people we gain functions that they lost, and if you want to go one step further beyond the religion view of our body as a whole, actually replace part of the body with new ones that are controlled by the brain. So that's our project, I want to tell you about it a little bit. And it's, it came from trying to understand how consciousness works, and it actually leads to many, many things that I think are beyond consciousness and are beyond evolution, trying to take it one step further into understanding how we can take over biology. That's it. <laughs>